Good morning and welcome to this inaugural episode of Five Minutes With. And it is my great pleasure and great honor to have as my very first guest today, uh, the Most Reverend Frank Griswold, who served, as most of you will know, as the 25th presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, uh, but for me personally has been a friend and a mentor dating back to my own time of discernment. So, Bishop Frank, thank you so much for being my first guest on Five Minutes With. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm glad to see you in your ordained state since I first knew you before all this happened. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we find ourselves, uh, sadly, in some very uncertain times, and it's causing a lot of instability for folks. Um, I certainly, in my lifetime, never expected to see this type of enforced separation from church and, and community, and even though we do have the gift of technology, it's still not quite the same. And... In thinking about this, I was struck by something you talked about uh, in your most recent book, uh, Tracking Down the Holy Ghost, and you used the phrase uh, to encourage, uh, talked about the phrase of encouraging people to examine the scripture of their lives. So in a time where people are feeling separated from word and sacrament, I was wondering if you'd take a little time this morning to, to talk about what you meant by that. Well, I think uh, what I mean by that is our lives are sacramental. Uh, Jesus, who could use bread, wine, oil, water, human touch, word, all kinds of things, even uh, saliva and, and mud, uh, can show up in any way whatsoever. And, and Christ is deeply present in our lives in what's going on right now. And I think the thing that's so important is to acknowledge how unsettling this experience is and not to sort of beat up on oneself because one feels it's sixes and sevens and can't quite figure out a routine every routine we've ever known is undermined by this situation in a funny way we're having a lent that is probably closer to what jesus experienced in the wilderness than anything we can create uh, you know, with parish dinners and all the rest of it that we usually do during Lent. I mean, it's a time of vulnerability, a time where uh, we feel separated and alone. And I think what's so important is to uh, access through taking seriously the fact that God is more intimate to us than we are to ourselves, that Christ is right here with us, not necessarily to rescue us but to companion us in this very strange time i'm aware that i mean in my own life i have to create patterns each day i have to sort of figure out okay there aren't the external things that tell me what to do and when to do them uh so i have to create a sort of daily rhythm otherwise i'm at sixes and sevens and part of that is simply accepting the fact that that christ is with me uh, even though I'm separated from other Christians and certainly separated from the celebration of the sacraments. And it, but at the same time, the real presence of Christ is, is with me in tiny things. I mean, a phone call, uh, someone who calls me up, I haven't talked to for a million years, but they've suddenly called. I think this is a gift, uh, having time to think, having time to read, having time that we have grandchildren close by and they're all part of this little unit of, uh, you know, we're all separated and yet we haven't gone anywhere. So we're all, we assume virus free. So the grandchildren can come over and bake and do various things or I can uh, throw balls at them or whatever. Uh, and, and just sort of say to myself, right now, this is where God is and God is inviting me to be. And just having that sense of where I am right now is the scripture of my own life happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Bernard of Clairvaux said, we read the, the book of scripture and the book of experience. And so I think this is an opportunity to sort of read our lives uh, in union with Christ. Well, in, in listening to talk about that, one thing that occurred to me is the vocational call that we have as children of Christ to show compassion, show mercy, show love. And in a time of 
community, it's something that you can do face to face and, and one to another. But in a time of separation, as you're coming up with the analysis of the scripture of life and coming up with new uh, practices in your daily routine to compensate for the separation, how can somebody practice compassion and practice mercy when there's no one there to share that or to, to display that for? Well, two ways. I've called up all sorts of people or emailed people uh, that I've had some relation to in the past and suddenly realized, oh, they're friends. I haven't talked to them or communicated with them. And so many people said, thank you so much. It's great to hear from you. And it's happened to me in, in turn. So I think one way one can show compassion and mercy. Is, do you know people who are alone? Uh, you know, I've, I've got a wife and as I said, grandchildren come and go. So I have a sense of community, but so many people are absolutely alone. I would say, who, who do you know who's alone and, and contact them? The other way, quite frankly, is prayer. I mean, I pray a lot for people who not only are housebound and anxious, but have lost their livelihood, have no idea how they're gonna pay the electric bill. Uh, what an agonizing condition to be in. Uh, and in some instances, uh, I can actually, you know, uh, send some money uh, to help uh, buy meals for the homeless, or uh, there are ways in which I'm not immobilized. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I say the first way is contact people, particularly people who are alone, uh, pray. Uh, pray for those who are in hospitals, pray for medical workers. Uh, and then if there are some actual ways in which you can be useful, I mean, our parish is trying to, it's an inner city parish, and uh, they're going to distribute uh, food uh, in about a week's time. Well, there are ways in which I can, uh, you know, uh, send a check or something to help uh, with that 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 whole process. Or there are a couple of people uh, who occasionally do things for us uh, and right now they're housebound so they can't do these various things and I know they're hurting so I sent them a, a little check and said hope this helps. Not much but just little things that you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suppose if you're you know if you're a baker or something you might bake something and assume it's safe and <laughs> get someone to deliver it, you know? <laughs> unless, I, unless I'm baking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and we're seeing samples of this because as, as depressing as it is to watch the news at night, knowing that every bit of the coverage is gonna be about coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeing these wonderful examples of uh, musicians coming out on the front porch to play for the neighbors every night, or uh, my wife and I saw a video last night of uh, a retired gentleman on one side of the street and a little girl on the other, and they were having a dance off. So uh -huh. it is wonderful to see these ways of neighbors uplifting one another during this time. Well, and then people have had sort of supper together virtually. Uh, uh, you know, as we're talking through uh, uh, computers, uh, people have uh, staged sort of dinner parties or suppers or lunches with with friends and in the same fashion so mm -hmm. there are ways in which we can do this but one of the most affecting ways uh i mean to go back to something you were saying uh there's a a young man in our congregation who's challenged in many ways but he plays the piano and uh he he opened the window in the living room and started playing the piano and in a house nearby, another young person who plays the cello heard the piano and opened their window. And so the two of them began to play the same piece and neighbors across the street opened their windows and smiled. And uh, uh, I, just, I just thought it was a wonderful, a wonderful inventive way. I mean, the other thing is at a time like this, the uh, imagination of the Holy Spirit uh, can invite us to do wacky things that uh, bring joy and a sense of community, even in the midst of these uh, enforced separations. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in thinking about the, the time we were going to have together this morning, uh, I was thinking back to uh, when you were 
presiding bishop and looking at the world then and looking at the world now and how much has changed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you kind of the impossible question to answer, but I just wanted to get your thoughts. Looking at where the church is now in comparison to where it was when you were presiding bishop, given the circumstances and the way we're exploring using new technology and new ways of staying connected during this time, if you had to guess, where do you see the church 10 years from now as a result of what we're doing now? Uh, well, <laughs> I have difficulty with hypothetical questions. I, I think, I think uh, we've become much more imaginative and realized that uh, so much of, I mean, so much of what I inherited was a church where you painted the doors red and waited for sensible people to know that that's where they belonged. Mm -hmm. But there was very little sense of uh, uh, how do you tweak the imagination or fascinate people or entice them, and I mean in the good ways, uh, uh, make them excited that the gospel might have something to say to them, particularly right now where for so many people who, who don't have any faith, Christianity is represented by a kind of very political and conservative evangelical tradition, or it's sexual misconduct in the, in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. uh, and people say, well, why would I ever want to be a Christian? Mm -hmm. Now, not that we haven't had our own problems, so I don't want to make it sound as though we're problem-free, but I do think uh, uh, some of the ways in which we engage people I mean, so many people now, young people particularly, find things on the web. Uh, they're not going to walk into the building, but they might find a post somewhere mm -hmm. uh, that is intriguing, and that sort of moves them to explore. So uh, I think the church of the future, or today, will become even more so, uh, won't lose the reality of incarnation. I mean, you can't really have the Eucharist without people actually being together. Right. And I think that's, I mean, we need to be clear about that. We can look at a Eucharist happening, but, and we can make a spiritual communion, as it were, but we can't really participate in the fullness of what it's about without being with other people. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I think as a kind of entry point or uh, an evangelical tool, we can do a lot with uh, electronic communication. So I think that's going to be a big piece. I also think, I think we're much more global at least the Episcopal Church is. I mean, the Anglican Communion in the past was sort of the Archbishop of Canterbury of, uh, coming to pay a visit uh, and everyone loving this sort of English voice and whatnot. But now we're very much engaged with other parts of the world. I think largely because of some of the struggles with the Anglican Communion and points of tension have created a much stronger sense of what does it actually mean mm -hmm. to be members one of another globally. So I think that that helps too. And I think, again, electronic communication has helped give us a, a, a more global sense, particularly at a time when we become more and more sort of chauvinistic uh, and separate as nations. I think there's a whole, a whole energy now to engage uh, more globally. And I think we'll become more global in our consciousness, at least as the Episcopal Church. Well, it's certainly been interesting even now among my own congregation to watch people that really have no experience with technology working to embrace it. And, you know, I did a Zoom coffee hour for the first time last Sunday. Oh, great. And it was great. for people that had never used Zoom before, and yeah. it was interesting to watch. They had it set up, but were sitting off to the side. And so I was having to tell them, you have to slide in a bit so that I could actually <laughs> see you. But, you know, people embracing it and tuning into live streams, and yeah. there's some wonderful collaboration. Uh, between churches in the area that are doing uh, pre-recorded services for Good Friday or for uh, Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday that will give hymns and music and a, a sense of community. So I think already it's it's starting to change in ways that I certainly couldn't have imagined. And if there's any great gift that I've been telling people about, it's the fact that as horrible as this is, it's yeah. happening now and not 30 years ago when none of this would have been possible. No, no, exactly. No, it's amazing what can happen. I, actually, one priest said, more people, I, I, he, he, he streamed this, uh, a service on Sunday, and he said, more people uh, 
watched it than ever appear in church on a Sunday. <laughs> and he said, I've had a larger congregation <laughs> electronically. <laughs> so who knows? I hope when it, the, the doors reopen, all those people who watched will come flocking in. So, <laughs> Oh, yes. So I thank you again for your time. At, here at the end of this, I want to ask you, if you had to give someone an elevator speech right now, six feet apart in the elevator, but in the elevator nonetheless, what would be your quick admonition or encouragement for them about maintaining faith and hope during this time? I would say this is a time of testing, just as Jesus was tested. I mean, so many of the externals have been removed, so it's an invitation to explore one's own depth of relationship to Christ. Christ is right there. I say there's something right there uh, there's there's living water flowing within you so this is an invitation to uh be vulnerable and available to that reality and just uh go with the flow of living water that is mm -hmm. well thank you again so much and uh, my best to you and phoebe and your family and uh, likewise to your family and and to your congregation blessings to you all Thank you again. Hope you take care. God bless you. Bless you too. Thank you, man. Bye-bye.